That was fun. I'm exhausted. <laughs> you make sure she gets a nap this afternoon because that is well earned. That was fun. Thank you very much. That's beautiful. Kids can make their way to Children's Church right now if you would like. That's a four-year-old to fourth grade. They are welcome to stay in here if you prefer that. Um, but it's a boring message today. I know. I, I know. I'm like bored at even just suggesting it because we had, Christine, this is the week to be gone. You're doing the right thing. She's not even working children's church. She's heading straight down the steps to Dunkin' Donuts because she's like, no way, and I'm taking my daughter with me. Yeah, you thought you were going to escape my... No. So, because um, here's, the, here's the deal with the text, Joshua 3. If you have a Bible, it's in Joshua 3. I didn't write it. But it's like, it's so... You have... You have uh, Rahab, great story. Rahab the harlot. I mean, you can't beat that guy's hiding in the roof. I mean, it's just a fun story. And then over here, you're going to have Jericho. I mean, there's veggie tales on that. I mean, that's a great story of Jericho. You have Rahab and you have Jericho, and you have these chapters in the middle. And I'm reading, and I'm like, okay, get me to another fun story, because you're not going to see a veggie tale based on chapter 3, 4, and 5. I promise. It's not going to be there. Um, kids won't buy it. Won't be fun to watch. And yet, somehow, we've got to figure out a way to realize that Rahab and Jericho and then three, four, and five. This is it. It's like it's so unexpected. These chapters are huge for us. There was a lady who had a birthday coming up, and she had a dream that she had um, uh, a diamond ring, beautiful diamond ring, and she wakes up and looks at her husband and says, oh, birthday later in the week, I had a dream about a diamond ring, and he says, eh, you're going to have to wait and find out. And she's all excited. The next day, she had another dream, and it was a diamond uh, necklace. She woke up so excited, and she's like, honey, because I, I know, just wait, just wait. Your birthday's coming. Third night, same thing, and it's another diamond piece of jewelry, and she's so excited, wakes up and tells the story, and it's her birthday, and he goes, all right. She opens it up, and sure enough, it's a book on how to interpret dreams. <laughs> so that's about, that's about as unexpected, didn't see that coming. I'm not kidding. Three, four, and five, the anticipation has been building since Abraham. Abraham was told, I mean, it's literally solo. It could have been at a coffee shop. It's, hey, I'm going to produce in you a huge group of people, and I'm going to give you land, promised land. That's Abraham. And then the time goes, and the time goes. And we're now 500 years later, and they are literally at the river. It's about to happen. You can't build the excitement and the significance of this moment anymore. It's impossible. You and I will never understand all the promises to Father Abraham, who had many sons, and all that movement. 400 years in Egypt. They make it some disobedience back out into the desert for another 40 years. Almost everybody's gone, that whole generation, almost everybody, and now they're back, and here they are. They scope the land. Rahab helped and said, no, believe me, we are really afraid. Help them escape back, and now, here we go. Literally, it's go time. But before 
from Rahab to the first conquering across the Jordan, Jericho, there's this, this section that is easy to look over, and yet it's the whole point. Everything's being risked right now. Moving ahead to finally take what God has promised prosperous, successful, courageous. It's all right here. And what happens in this movement, and part of it is, I'll I'll tell you ahead of time, is a little clumsy. The views of what's going on, it's a difficult passage but there's a simplicity of message. If you're looking for success in your life and your walk with God and you want a successful family, career, if you want to move ahead, if you want to take another step, this is what you do. I mean, we do the same. It is literally played out for us dramatically between Rahab and Jericho, the same things that we'll do. If you're facing something really big today, confusion and decision-making, facing a big business that is impossible to go up against, a court case that you, you're at their mercy, literally at their mercy, a relationship struggle, how do, you, how do you conquer this? And we're going to see it in this passage so clearly that Jericho's story without these chapters would have missed the whole point. We would never have seen it. We need to see this first, and you and I can adopt these three. They're not steps. They're mindsets, this process before we go and conquer and find ourselves successful in what we do. Let's pray. Father, in heaven, we're asking that you would show us from this passage some of this amazing truth. We don't want to look past it. We want to see it today. We're acknowledging it's not as dramatic sounding as these stories around, but please, Help it to apply into our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bible there, it's Joshua 3. It's Joshua 3. So literally, this chapter before ended with the story of Rahab. Hey, it's good. We're all good. Okay, now what? Let's go conquer Jericho. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, verse 1. And they sent out from, uh, from Shittim, and they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. If you write in your Bible, if you circle real lightly passed over, it's used 22 times in this passage. It's a key. It's very important. At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people. Here it goes. As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there should also be a distance between you and it which is about a thousand yards in length. Don't come near it in order that you may know the way you should go, for you have not passed this way before. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priest, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and they went before the people. Okay, so here it is. We know it's blessed of God. We know they're going to win at Jericho because they were already told. And there's the Ark of the Covenant. I don't know, so smaller than this table. And they said, you come out of your tent and you stand there. And we have 40,000 soldiers. So kind of do some math, a number of people that we're dealing with here of all the people of Israel, all the 12 tribes. They said, you come out of your tent and you stand there. 
Do not move until you see the Ark of the Covenant. Don't even move. And when it passes by, I love this, don't get near it. A thousand yards behind it. That's a long ways. 100 yards football, 10 on each end, 120 yards, eight, nine football fields. Just don't get near it. But when you see it and you lock eyes and it goes by, you let it keep going, you let it get far ahead, and then you follow. There it is. It's the lesson. Oh, the story's unbelievable. It's fantastic because they go, and then, of course, the feet of those carrying the ark touch the water, and the water is actually held back 15 miles upriver is where the wall of water was being held back. And they all want to cross. Cross over, cross over, cross over, cross over, cross over. You and I want to cross over to the promised land. Do not move until you lock eyes with him. The New Testament significance is as great because the tabernacle, it's, it's the ta- tabernacle means uh, dwelling. It's his dwelling. So you say he tabernacled among them. That's the phrase. You tabernacled. He dwelt there. Well, that was God. He wasn't there. He wasn't in your heart. He was He was there. But then in John chapter 1, Jesus Christ comes on the scene. And Jesus Christ was the Word. He was with God. He was God. And dwelt among them. He tabernacled among them. He showed up. It's Jesus. Oh, it builds just for your own fun of study. You have the tabernacle in the, in the Old Testament. You have Jesus tabernacling among them. And then you have Revelation 21, where all the culmination of everything of Revelation, I don't even understand it all, but it's crazy, it's wild, it's apocalyptic. It all builds to Revelation 21, where it says, ah, I added that part. It goes, ah, now. The dwelling of God is with man. That's, that's, that's been the goal. He wants to dwell with you. Oh, I want to go on and conquer. No, there's nothing in that. The promotion at work, well, that's not, you're not going to be happier. That's, that's not the move. That's not the goal. The goal is dwelling with God. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we dwell with him, and we lock eyes with him, and we don't take a step without him. It's very simple to determine. Do we wake up and just face our day? It's either me-centered or it's him-centered. And I literally could listen as you could to my day as I explain my day and how I get up and the first thing I do and when I have my coffee and what kind of cereal, Fruit Loops, and what I do in this process, you can catch on by the sequence of my day if it's me-centered or if it's him-centered. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. I know it in your life. Just be honest and tell me what you do through your morning before you get out of the house. I will tell you in response easily. I will show you whether you were moving across on your own to conquer your day or you were standing at your tent waiting to lock eyes and not move until you see him. Pretty easy to determine. It's just being honest enough to say it and to see it. But then, 
That's chapter 3. That's all of chapter 3. But then there's chapter 4. And I literally put in my Bible a little parenthesis of 4 1 down to 418 because there's this story going on. Because the first point is pause, don't move. The second point is commemorate. Because you say, oh, once I see him move, now let's go fit. No, actually not. No, you're ahead of it still. I lock eyes and I calm myself and center myself with him through his word in using music or using a devotional as we study and look into his word and meditate. We're pausing to lock. Not going to move till this. But then the very next chapter talks about commemorating being thankful for the fact of what he's doing for us. I'd be like, can we take Jericho for heaven's sake? I mean, like, let's strike while it's hot. They're afraid. Come on, let's go. No, slow down. They commemorate. So this story, if you have, like, too much time on your hands, It's like three different views. It's like a a movie where you have three different things happening at once. You have these 12 guys collecting stones. Yeah, that's, that's there. That's part of it. You have the people that are now crossing over this opening in the water. So you have that too. And then you have the priests. They're doing something. There's so many views happening here. In fact, it almost looks, if you read this passage, just on your own, read chapter 4, you wonder if there are there two different times that they're actually setting up stones. It looks like, no, I think it's the same story. It's repetitive. You could take out a little section and you don't lose any of the story. There's a, there's a very interesting repetition. But the idea was, we're finally crossing over into the promised land that was promised all the way back in Abraham, and it's taken us forever to get here. We're crossing over. Let's all stop a minute and commemorate this. This is a big deal. And it literally is for us to commemorate what God has done in our life. I've seen it. I've seen, uh, I've seen it with quilts. Because the old time, the great quilt making, real quilt, they can tell a story. Anything to commemorate. Because it said why, so the generations ahead will not forget. What are you leaving behind for the next generation to remember and know that you're one standing up and saying, God did this. God has done this for us. They're commemorating. They're stopping and being thankful for what God has done in their life. Then chapter 5. This... This is literally the mark of the covenant, circumcision. It's literally the mark of the covenant, which those of the 40 years hadn't had. We're going to stop and do this now? Yeah, we are. Well, you know, we're going to be a little vulnerable for a while. Yeah, text said so. Yeah, you gotta, we're going we're gonna to go through all the entire camp. Everyone's circumcised as a sign of the covenant, and we don't move until everyone's healed. And they all go, well, thanks for that. I mean, that's stuck right in here, consecrating themselves. And the last one is the one I really want us to think about. And and you know what? I think it's because it's another story. It's another picture that is fun for us to see. And it's like the night before Jericho. It's chapter 6. Now, Jericho was shut up inside uh, no, where are we? Uh, 13. 5, 13. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. 
Joshua went to him and said, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? And he said, no, but I'm a commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. No. Well, well, wait a minute. I'm facing a battle here, and I'm the commander, and I'm going to take this city. Are you for us or are you for them? No. Neither. Well, you have to be one or the other. No. No, you're backwards. This is the commander of the army of the Lord. We join him. He doesn't join us. There's a huge significance to this. The battle that you're facing, relationship or a work situation or school, and you're like, look at this mindset, the me or him-centered mindset. We're facing this struggle, and we say, God, I'm, I'm really struggling with this. It's my health, and do I take more meds? Do I not take more meds? It's counseling. It's whatever you're facing. It's, that's your road, and you're thinking, God, I want you to join me in my battle. And he says, no, you're wrong. Sorry, you're off. I'm not on your side. And you're like, hmm. I could really use this. No, no, you're, no, it's better. It's better than what you're thinking. God says, this is my battle. This is my battle, and I'm going to bring you victory. Join me. Am I right? Is that not totally different? What do you mean, your battle? Yeah, egocentric my life, my battle, I grab God by a Bible verse or an occasional prayer or a post-it on my mirror, and I'm going to bring him into my life to make my life the way it should be. That is as ego self-centered as what the world is. We're just using God for it. Instead, we surrender to him My life is your life, Lord. I've given it to you. My family is your family, thank goodness. It's not my car, it's your car. It's not my money that I get in a paycheck, that's your money. Complete and total surrender to Him. And it's the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's all of your scars, they're all His. Your strengths and abilities, you're so talented, they're his. You give it to him. Your family, many of them you like. And then there's the others. They're both. God, they're all yours. My illness, it's yours. My life situation, which you wake up and you don't like it. Every day you wake up, I can't believe I'm here. It's not your battle. It's his God, whose side are you on? Are you on my side or are you on the side of the courts? Are you on the side of my oppressor? Are you on the side of my adversary? And he says, no. (laughs) He says, no. You're like, you can't answer. That wasn't one of the options. He goes, no, I'm not on either side. I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. Let me tell you what else it does that's faulty when you think and I think that my battle is mine, when I think my battle is mine and God is on my side, that means my adversary, God is not with them because he's with me. You know how many horrible things have been done in the history of the world for the I'm speaking for God? God is on my side, right? I mean, There have been some pretty big battles. But you have to conclude that. I'm in the right. What I'm doing is right. And my plan is biblical and it's God-honoring. God is on my side in this. And if you stand against them, you must be standing against God. See that reasoning? That's how an evangelical Christian could be such a jerk. 
because it's wrong. No, my goal, your goal every day is to wake up and not move until we see him. Don't move. Well, I'm not doing much today. No, you're doing enough that you could make some mistakes. You could really mess things up. Just don't do it on your own. Why would you want to? Don't move till you see him. Commemorate. Give thanks. Set yourself apart. Consecrate yourself. And then surrender. This isn't my battle. This is your battle when I'm joining you. I think as part of this, and I'm not sure how, how exactly this has happened, but think, uh, think broadly, just in, in conclusion, it's kind of broadly. They left Egypt, and that's the, uh, the Red Sea crossing that we all know and love. I mean, that's the famous one. It didn't hold it back, a little different. They left Egypt, which symbolized freedom from sin and oppression and bondage, and it was through a crossing. And there was a strong wind, the passage says, that swept through in the wall of water on both sides and Charlton Heston right in the middle, right? So, okay. So, or Moses. We'll call him Moses. So Moses right in the middle, they go across dry land, and then it closes in on the enemy. They should have made their all the way to the Jordan, crossed over, started taking the promise, and they didn't. They chose not to obey, and it's 40 years of wandering. That's over, and it's now another crossing. So this crossing is a little different. It's a river. It's not even that big. I know many of you have been there to the Jordan, would love to take you someday. Uh, it's not a very big uh, river. It's not even very deep, depending on time of year, um, 10 feet. I mean, you can easily just wade across it. I mean, it's, you go down to those three rivers, those are rivers. <laughs> I mean, those things are impressive. This, not so much. High season, it's higher. But you're taking tens of thousands of people over. It's, it's a mess. This is not, it's not going to be smooth or easy. And they wait. Don't move. Ark goes by. Their feet go in. And the water, 15 miles up, starts to wall up. Just starts to wall up. It's just being held back. A little different, right, than the Red Sea? A little different. Same ending, same story, to cross over into the promised land. One on one end, one on the other end. This whole series is based on this. It's not enough to just leave Egypt, enter the promised land. It's not just enough. It would be accepting God's mercy. His mercy is withholding punishment. It's eliminating in your life the bondage and consequence of sin. That's the Egypt part. But grace is on this end. This is his mercy. His grace is receiving all the blessings and all the promises of God. It's on this side. And I want that in my life. And you can have it whether you're in a jail cell or sleeping under a bridge. It actually doesn't matter how big the house or apartment or studio. It doesn't matter if you're going home to an empty house and it used to be full and buster, or maybe it never was. It doesn't make any difference, any of that. None of that matters. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. It doesn't matter if it was 10 years ago or Friday night. It doesn't matter. We all can cross over into the blessings of God. How do you cross over the blessings of God? Jesus Christ, our dwelling, don't move until you see him move. Lock eyes with him. 
Don't face your day, oh, it's a normal day, I can just do. No, it might be a normal day, but God may have abnormal things for you to do. He has super special things for you to do today, tomorrow, that you are unprepared for because you left the tent and moved on without him. Don't move on without him. Just wait. Open the Bible. And I'll open sometimes, and I'm like, God, I'm here. And and God reveals to me, I need to get a half gallon of milk today. And I'm like, okay, that came into my mind. All right, half gallon of milk. (laughs) He's going to be earth-shaking, or the curtain's going to move. No, we're not saying any of that. I don't don't know what he's going to say to you. But what it's doing is centering ourselves on him in saying, I don't want to move, I don't want to do anything or speak or commit to something without you. I'm just here to tell you that. You move, I'll move. You get mad, I'll get mad. Compassion, compassion. I want to move in sync. I want to be so tied that we move together. Because it's not my day. It's your day. I'm joining you as you care for me, people around me, my schedule, my agenda. It's lock eyes. We commemorate him. And then we surrender. I hope between Rahab and Jericho that today may resonate a little bit with you practically on what we do the rest of today and especially tomorrow as we face another day, another week. Pray with me if you would. As we bow in prayer right now and you say, I'm facing some things. They're overwhelming. And I'm willing to surrender that to him. I'm going to say, hey, this is your battle. It's not my battle. No one looking around, and you just say, it's, I'm not going to come after you. I'm not going to point you out. But you say, I'm willing right now to give that over to him. Lift your hand up. No one's looking but me. Just say, yep, I'm willing to give it to him. That's right. You can put it right back down again. Thank you. Yeah, all over. You say, God, I'm surrendering. Thank you. I see that surrendering to you. I don't want to move. Heavenly Father, including you in our words, we don't want to move without you. We surrender to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.